Welcome to a fireside reading of Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapter 123, The Musket. During the most violent shocks of the typhoon, the man at the Pequod's jawbone tiller had several times been reelingly hurled to the deck by its spasmodic motions, even though preventer tackles had been attached to it, for they were slack, because some play to the tiller was indispensable. In a severe gale like this, while the ship is but a tossed shuttlecock to the blast, it is by no means uncommon to see the needles in the compasses at intervals go round and round. It was thus with the Pequods. At almost every shock, the helmsman had not failed to notice the whirling velocity with which they revolved upon the cards, it is a sight that hardly anyone can behold without some sort of unwonted emotion. Some hours after midnight, the typhoon had abated so much that through the strenuous exertions of Starbuck and Stubb, one engaged forward and the other aft, the shivered remnants of the jib and fore and main topsails were cut adrift from the spars and went eddying away to leeward, like the feathers of an albatross, which sometimes are cast to the winds when that storm-tossed bird is on the wing. The three corresponding new sails were now bent and reefed, and a storm trysail was set further aft, so that the ship soon went through the water with some precision again. And the course, for the present, east-southeast, which he was to steer, if practicable, was once more given to the helmsman. For during the violence of the gale he had only steered according to its vicissitudes. But as he was now bringing the ship as near her course as possible, watching the compass meanwhile, lo, a good sign, the wind seemed coming round astern. Aye, the foul breeze became fair. Instantly the yards were squared to the lively song of Ho, oh, the fair wind, O oh, ye ho, cheerly men, the crew singing for joy that so promising an event should so soon have falsified the evil portents preceding it. In compliance with the standing order of his commander to report immediately and at any one of the twenty-four hours any decided change in the affairs of the deck, Starbuck had no sooner trimmed the yards to the breeze, however reluctantly and gloomily, than he mechanically went below to apprise Captain Ahab of the circumstance. Ere knocking at his stateroom, he involuntarily paused before it a moment. The cabin lamp, taking long swings this way and that, was burning fitfully and casting fitful shadows upon the old man's bolted door, a thin one with fixed blinds inserted in case of upper panels. The isolated subterraneousness of the cabin made a certain humming silence to reign there, though it was hooped round by all the roar of the elements. The loaded muskets in the rack were shiningly revealed as they stood upright against the forward bulkhead. Starbuck was an honest, upright man, but out of Starbuck's heart, at that instant when he saw the muskets, there strangely evolved an evil thought. But so blent with its neutral or good accompaniments that for the instant he hardly knew it for itself. He would have shot me once, he murmured. Yes, there's the very musket that he pointed at me, that one with the studded stock. 
Let me touch it. Lift it. Strange that I, who have handled so many deadly lances, strange that I should shake so now. Loaded, I must see. Ay, ay, and powder in the pan. That's not good. Best spill it? Wait. I'll cure myself of this. I'll hold the musket boldly while I think. I come to report a fair wind to him. But how fair? Fair to death and doom? That's fair for Moby Dick. It's a fair wind that's only fair for that accursed fish. The very tube he pointed at me. The very one, this one. I hold it here. He would have killed me with the very thing I handle now. I and he would feign all his crew. Does he not say he will not strike his spars to any gale? Has he not dashed his heavenly quadrant? And in these same perilous seas gropes he not his way by mere dead reckoning of the error abounding log? And in this very typhoon did he not swear that he would have no lightning rods? But shall this crazy old man be tamely suffered to drag a whole ship's company down to doom with him? Yes, it would make him the willful murderer of thirty men and more if this ship come to any deadly harm. And come to deadly harm, my soul swears this ship will, if Ahab have his way. If then he were this instant put aside that crime would not be his. <sighs> Is he muttering in his sleep? Yes, just there, in there. He's sleeping. Sleeping, aye, but still alive and soon awake again. I can't withstand thee then, old man, not reasoning, not remonstrance, not entreaty wilt thou hearken to. All this thou scornest. Flat obedience to thy own flat commands, this is all thou breathest. Aye, and sayest the men have vowed thy vow, sayest all of us are Ahab's, great God forbid. But is there no other way, no lawful way? Make him a prisoner to be taken home? What, hope to wrest this old man's living power from his own living hands? Say he were pinioned even, knotted all over with ropes and hawsers, chained down to ring bolts on this cabin floor. He would be more hideous than a caged tiger. I would not endure the sight, could not possibly fly his howlings. All comfort, sleep itself, inestimable reason would leave me on the long intolerable voyage. What then remains? The land is hundreds of leagues away and locked Japan the nearest. I stand alone here upon an open sea with two oceans and a whole continent between me and law. Aye, aye, tis so. Is heaven a murderer when its lightning strikes a would-be murderer in his bed, tindering sheets and skin together? And would I be a murderer then if... And slowly, stealthily, and half sideways looking, he placed the loaded musket's end 
against the door. On this level, Ahab's hammock swings within his head this way. A touch, and Starbuck may survive to hug his wife and child again. Oh, Mary, Mary, boy, boy, boy. But if I wake thee not to death, old man, who can tell to what unsounded deeps Starbuck's body this day week may sink with all the crew? Great God, where art thou? Shall I? Shall I? The wind has gone down. And shifted, sir. The fore and main topsails are reefed and set. She heads her course. Stern all. Oh, Moby Dick, I clutch thy heart at last. Such were the sounds that now came hurtling from out the old man's tormented sleep as if Starbuck's voice had caused the long, dumb dream to speak. The yet-leveled musket shook like a drunkard's arm against the panel. Starbuck seemed wrestling with an angel. But turning from the door, he placed the death tube in its rack and left the place. He's too sound asleep, Mr. Stubb. Go thou down and wake him and tell him. I must see to the deck here. Thou knowest what to say. Chapter 124 The Needle Next morning, the not yet subsided sea rolled in long, slow billows of mighty bulk, and striving in the Pequod's gurgling track pushed her on like giant's palms outspread. A strong, unstaggering breeze abounded so that sky and air seemed vast, outbellying sails. The whole world boomed before the wind. Muffled in the full morning light, the invisible sun was only known by the spread intensity of his place, where his bayonet rays moved on in stacks. Emblazonings, as of crowned Babylonian kings and queens, reigned over everything. The sea was as a crucible of molten gold that bubblingly leaps with light and heat. Long maintaining an enchanted silence, Ahab stood apart, and every time the teetering ship loweringly pitched down her bowsprit, he turned to eye the bright sun's rays produced ahead, and when she profoundly settled by the stern, he turned behind and saw the sun's rearward place and how the same yellow rays were blending with his undeviating wake. Ha ha! My ship, thou mightest well be taken now for the sea chariot of the sun. Ho ho! All ye nations before my prow, I bring the sun to ye. Yoke on the further billows, Hello, a tandem! I drive the sea! But suddenly reined back by some counter-thought, he hurried towards the helm, huskily demanding how the ship was heading. East, so we sir, said the frightened steersman. Thou liest! smiting him with his clenched fist. Heading east at this hour in the morning? And the sun astern? 
upon this, every soul was confounded. For the phenomenon just then observed by Ahab had unaccountably escaped every one else. But its very blinding palpableness must have been the cause. Thrusting his head halfway into the binnacle, Ahab caught one glimpse of the compasses. His uplifted arm slowly fell. For a moment he almost seemed to stagger. Standing behind him, Starbuck looked, and lo, the two compasses pointed east, and the Pequod was as infallibly going west. But ere the first wild alarm could get out abroad among the crew, the old man, with a rigid laugh, he exclaimed, I have it! Ha! It has happened before, Mr. Starbuck. Last night's thunder turned our compasses, that's all. Thou hast before now heard of such a thing, I take it. Aye, but never before as it happened to me, sir, said the pale mate gloomily. Here it must needs be said that accidents like this have in more than one case occurred to ships in violent storms. The magnetic energy as developed in the mariner's needle is, as all know, essentially one with the electricity beheld in heaven. Hence, it is not to be much marveled at that such things should be. Instances where the lightning has actually struck the vessel so as to smite down some of the spars and rigging, the effect upon the needle has at times been still more fatal, all its lodestone virtue being annihilated so that the before magnetic steel was of no more use than an old wife's knitting needle. But in either case, the needle never again of itself recovers the original virtue thus marred or lost. And if the binnacle compasses be affected, the same fate reaches all the others that may be in the ship, even were the lowermost one inserted into the kelson. Deliberately standing before the binnacle and eyeing the transpointed compasses, the old man, with the sharp of his extended hand, now took the precise bearing of the sun, and satisfied that the needles were exactly inverted, shouted out his orders for the ship's course to be changed accordingly. The yards were hard up, and once more the Pequod thrust her undaunted bows into the opposing wind, for the supposed fair one had only been juggling her. Meanwhile, whatever were his own secret thoughts, Starbuck said nothing, but quietly he issued all requisite orders, while Stubb and Flask, who in some small degree seemed then to be sharing his feelings, likewise unmurmuringly acquiesced. As for the men, though some of them lowly rumbled, their fear of Ahab was greater than their fear of fate. But as ever before, the pagan harponeers remained almost wholly unimpressed, or if impressed, it was only with a certain magnetism shot into their congenial hearts from inflexible Ahabs. For a space, the old man walked the deck in rolling reveries, but chancing to slip with his ivory heel, he saw the crushed copper sight tubes of the quadrant he had the day before dashed to the deck. Thou poor, proud, heaven-gazer and sun's pilot. Yesterday I wrecked thee, and today the compasses would fain have wrecked me. So, so. But Ahab is lord over the level lodestone yet. Mr. Starbuck, a lance without a pole, a top maul, and the smallest of the sailmaker's needles. Quick! 
accessory perhaps to the impulse dictating the thing he was now about to do, were certain prudential motives, whose object might have been to revive the spirits of his crew by a stroke of his subtle skill in a matter so wondrous as that of the inverted compasses. Besides, the old man well knew that to steer by transpointed compasses, though clumsily practicable, was not a thing to be passed over by superstitious sailors without some shudderings and evil portents. Man, said he steadily turning upon the crew, as the mate handed him the things he had demanded, my men, the thunder turned old Ahab's needles. But out of this bit of steel, Ahab can make one of his own that will point as true as any. Abashed glances of servile wonder were exchanged by the sailors, as this was said, and with fascinated eyes they awaited whatever magic might follow. But Starbuck looked away. With a blow from the top maul, Ahab knocked off the steel head of the lance, and then, handing to the mate the long iron rod remaining, bade him hold it upright, without it touching the deck. Then, with the maul, after repeatedly smiting the upper end of this iron rod, he placed the blunted needle endwise on the top of it, and less strongly, hammered that several times, the mate still holding the rod as before, then going through some small strange motions with it, whether indispensable to the magnetizing of the steel or merely intended to augment the awe of the crew is uncertain, he called for linen thread and moving to the binnacle, slipped out the two reversed needles there and horizontally suspended the sail needle by its middle over one of the compass cards. At first, the steel went round and round, quivering and vibrating at either end, but at last it settled to its place. When Ahab, who had been intently watching for this result, stepped frankly back from the binnacle, and pointing his stretched arm towards it, exclaimed, Look ye for yourselves, if Ahab be not lord of the level lodestone. The sun is east, and that compass swears it. One after another they peered in, for nothing but their own eyes could persuade such ignorance as theirs, and one after another they slunk away. In his fiery eyes of scorn and triumph, you then saw Ahab in all his fatal pride. Thanks for joining me. My name is Gilda Jackson, and this is Fireside Reading. Please check us out at the YouTube channel, Fireside Reading, where you can find all the books we've read. And if you'd like to subscribe and like and comment, please do. Alternatively, I read live every day at 5 Pacific at Fireside Reading on Instagram. Until I see you again, please be very well. Goodbye.